prepare our last subsection is about the due space of LP space. Um, so we are going to uh, consider, just to remember that when we have considered the LP space, uh, the P has a conjugate, which we call the Q, so if they satisfy this, right? Um, and this is also equivalent to that Q is equal to the P minus, uh, P over P minus 1. Um, this is for the case P and Q are both greater than 1, but uh, usually they can, we can extend this to the case where P is equal to 1, q is equal to infinity, or vice versa. And uh, we'll specify that uh, if, if, uh, if that's also okay. All right, so we're going to, um, so the claim right now is that the due space of LP will be the LQ. But uh, we need to be very careful when P or Q is equal to 1, uh, because in that case, uh, this may not, be hold, uh, may not hold. But if P is greater than 1, then we can always say that the due space of LP is equal to the LQ. Okay, so to do that, let's first uh, consider the following theorem. So let P be 1 to infinity. And uh, we have a function f that is in LP. Again, it's some measurable set. We don't really have to specify it, it's just a general uh, arbitrary set. Then there exists. So if f is in Rp, then there exists a uh, function g in Rq such that the q norm of g is equal to 1, and also the p norm of f is equal to the integral of uh, f and g, or basically the inner product. Of f and g. Okay, this is actually this. Okay, so actually this p, this f is in Rp, this g is in Rq. And the inner product of this equal to that, where this uh, g has a q norm equal to 1. Okay, so let's prove this. We first consider that the p is equal to 1. So when p is equal to 1, uh, then we can set g because I just need the uh, uh, some function g with norm, infinity norm equal to one, uh, and uh, the one norm of f is equal to the inner product of f and g. And in this case, we can just choose g to be the sign of f. Okay, and in this case, uh, f x is greater than one. A greater than zero, then we set it to one, and less than zero, we can set it to negative one. If it's zero, we can just set it to zero or anything else. It doesn't, uh, or one or negative one doesn't matter. But let's say that we just uh, uh, define it to be this. F of x is greater than one. Greater, oh, sorry, greater than zero. F x is equal to zero. F x is less than zero. Okay, just a sign of the function f. And then we can see that the one norm of f is equal to the integral of f and g, because the g right now is the sine of f. So the product of f and the sine of f will be just the the uh, uh, the integral of f. So that's why uh, this this holds. And also apparently this g if we set in this way the the Infinity norm of g must be equal to one. Right, it must be equal to one. It cannot be zero because uh, uh, f is in uh, in uh, uh, if well, well, if f is zero, then uh, we don't need to do anything, right? Um, but if f is non-zero, then it must be non-zero somewhere, and then um, if it's not zero almost everywhere, then there must be positive or negative on a uh, uh, set with the measure, positive measure, and in that case, the, the infinity norm of G must be equal to 1. Okay, and uh, now let's see the general case where P is P 
between uh, is bigger than one. And in this case, uh, we know that we can define this g to be the sine of f times the p minus one norm, uh, p minus one's power of the absolute value of f divided by a constant, and this constant is p norm of f with uh, the power of p minus one. So remember that this is just the denominator is a constant. This is uh, either one or negative one, depending on where the x is. And this at the point x is equal to that. Okay, so that's in this case, let's check. First of all, the uh, the g norm, uh, the q norm, sorry, the q norm, uh, or the qth power of q norm is this. Right, and then let's see what this value is. And according to our definition, that would be just the absolute value of this. Okay, but this take the absolute value would just be would be just equal to one, so we are just taking the that. Okay, and uh, remember the denominator is just a constant. We can pull it out, and we also have the uh, num the numerator will be left there and. Uh, well, um, sorry, I need to put the qth power. So this to the power q, this to the q, or q, this to the power q. So here I have the power q, and then the integral of this f, p minus one q, dx. Don't need dx. Okay. So actually, I, I should say that because the q is the conjugate of p, so the q equals to p over p minus 1. So we already know that the q times p minus 1 is actually just equal to p. Okay, so this is nothing but just p. This is also just p. Okay, so I maybe just uh, write it directly. So it will be just uh, the p norm p, and the, the integral of this will be fp okay and apparently this one itself is just equal to the denominator because it's the pth norm of uh, the pth uh, pth power of uh, the p norm of f so they will be just cancelled so one will be just uh, the same so they cancel and it will be just equal to one and other at on the other hand let's set check the f times g uh, in this case, remember that the g is just uh, this, so we just put, put that, plug this in, and the, the sign of f and f together would be just f, absolute value of f, and then we have that, p, p minus 1. And this becomes, again, f, p, p minus 1, and the integral of f, p. Okay? And then apparently this is again equal to that the pth power of the p norm of f. So I have this. And denominator is this. And then we canceled. Only have one of this left. So that shows the second second one here. Okay, so in this case we can see we um, either p is equal to one or greater than one, we can show that there exists a function g and our q, and then we show that the norm of g is equal to 1, and uh, we also show that in this case, the uh, inner product uh, here is equal to this. Okay, And actually, as you can see, this inner product of f and g, so we finished the proof, so that we just want to give, I want just want to give a remark here. This, in general, we know that it's less than equal to the fp gq because of the holder's inequality right now the q we can just divide this. if g is not zero then we can divide this g uh, on both sides the norm of the q norm of g on both sides then this will be equivalent to the f g gq okay and this will be less than equal to f so in general we should have that 
Uh, and uh, in this case, the theorem says that for each f uh, in Lp, we can choose the g, g in this way. Either if p is equal to 1, then we just choose your g to be that. And if g is not equal to 1, then we can, uh, if g is bigger than 1, we just choose our g to be this. And in this case, we can show that, we can show the equality holds. We can actually show that the equality holds. Okay, so in those cases, this becomes equality, or in other words, this becomes equality. Okay, so to be more precise, what I'm trying to say is, for example, if p is bigger than 1, then I would just need to choose my f. Uh, for any f, I just need to choose my g to be psi of f, and then f p minus 1 divided by the uh, this, P, uh, P, P minus 1 norm. Okay, as we said earlier. And then the inner product of this will be, so this is our G, this will be equal to the F P norm times the G Q norm. But in this case, Q norm is equal to 1. So that means you can also scale this by any constant. And then you just have a constant here. And that will be the actual G norm. Okay, so if you multiply this by C, then this this norm will be just equal to the to C, to absolute value of C. So you will have uh, actually have the equality. So this tells you that when the holder uh, inequality becomes equality. See, uh, so that's what the this one actually implies. The other one is that um, as we know this F G. One norm is less than or equal to the f p norm times g q norm. So uh, let's say that we, if g is non-zero, we can also do this. Okay, and this is always less than or equal to this. Well, in other word, uh, because this is just a constant I can put in, and if I take the supremum. It will be still less than that. Take the supremum over G in L Q will be still in that. So that just means that this quantity is always less than or equal to the right hand side. Um, but the question is in which case this becomes equality. As we showed earlier, if P is equal to if P is greater than one, or P is equal to one, or greater than one, but it's not infinity, then we actually can change this supremum to maximum. Because in either of these two cases, we showed that how do you choose this G to actually reach the supremum, okay? And that's uh, telling us that when P is equal to one or some fin any final number, then the P norm of F is actually equal to the maximum of FG. You can use the FG, but actually you can also just replace by inner product, it's okay as well. So you can replace this numerator by inner product of fg, that's okay as well. Uh, because you can always change the sign of g so that the uh, it is the sign of g is the same as the sign of f, and then it will be the same. And then also this denominator is g q norm. So among all the g in Lq, we can actually I find this maximizer that to such that these two sides are equal. Okay, so the supremum becomes the maximum. Okay, um, and we can also get similar result for the L for p equals to infinity, but uh, we need to be very careful that since the result is not as good as here, we can get the supremum equal to the p norm of f, but or in this case, when p is equal to just uh, this, we can get. Uh, let me just show you in here. We can get that the infinity norm of f is equal to the supremum of f g one divided by g one, where g is in R one. Okay, we're gonna get a supremum. But unfortunately, we cannot really find such a g. We probably cannot 
find this g uh, such that the superimum becomes infim uh, becomes a maximum means we cannot really find the maximizer uh, in general and let me first show this and, the, and then tell you why the superimum may not be achieved okay the proof so what we can do here is um, uh, if the uh, the g no, the the one norm of g is equal to one, then mm, let me. So I, I first say that I simplify this or rewrite this in a different way. I can see that this I can always put this norm together with g so that it can just be uh, normalized. So the supremum is taking over all the g's with the one norm equals to one. Okay. Now, if say uh, if the let's say if the one norm of g is equal to one, then apparently we have the uh, the absolute value of this integral will be less than equal to the uh, integral of the absolute value and this is apparently less than equal to that times the one norm of g and the, because the one norm of g is equal to one so this is just less than equal to that okay and this is true for any uh, function g with the r1 norm equal to one and this shows that the uh, supremum of the uh, uh, fg1 or I should say yeah this will be uh, remember this is the always greater than equal to the absolute value of f and g right because this uh, this here is just uh, just equal to the integral of the absolute value so this is always less than that Okay, anyway, um, we say we have, let's just consider this. Or maybe not. Let's do that. Now this tells us that this is less than or equal to that. Okay, so we know that supremum must be less than or equal to that. And that we need to show that. Uh, the other direction works and we also need to show this okay so to show that uh, let m be the uh, r infinity norm of f then for any epsilon greater than zero i know that the set the set um, A equals to the set of points where f is bigger than m minus epsilon, and I know that uh, I know that this set will have a positive measure. The reason is if it is if it is measure zero, then m minus epsilon will be the essential upper bound of f, and in that case. Uh, it will be contradiction to this because in this case i minus epsilon or even smaller will be the area infinity norm okay so we know that the measure of a must be positive okay and it's positive uh and then we can check just let g because it, we just needed the r1 norm of g is equal to one to be equal to one so let's say that we set our g to be the uh, uh, the sign of f times divided by a times the uh, characteristic function of a. Okay, so this is a constant. So this is either one or negative one. This a, uh, this a is a measure. Of that. So let's say call this a. Define this to be a. so it's a positive number. It's just a it's just a measure of the set a, 
and then this is the characteristic function of the set A. Okay, then we can check that um, the L1 norm of G is equal to the apps value of G take the integral over the set E, and this becomes, as you can see, when we take the apps value, and uh, this just becomes 1 over A, so it's 1 over A times uh, the uh, chi A for E, and this the 1 over A can be pulled out, and uh, this is just the integral of A. Okay? For one and this is just a one or a times the measure of a but the measure of a uh, we denote it by a by the little a so this is just equal to one right we said this this so that's why this is equal to one so that means the hour norm of g is equal to one on the other hand we know that the uh, uh, the product of f and g so this is equal to f times, according to the g, is the sine of f divided by a and then chi a. And this is equal to the absolute value of a, f divided by a chi a. And this is just a, you know, it's just a 1 over a integral over a, absolute value of a. Okay, but we know that over the set a, uh, the absolute value of f is bigger than uh, m minus absolute. Okay, so it's bigger than go to this times a m minus absolute, and this is equal to over a times m minus absolute times the measure of a. But this will cancel with this again, and this becomes m minus absolute. So we show that this is bigger than equal to uh, m minus epsilon for any epsilon, and this just means that uh, uh, the supremum of this for g, one norm of g equal to 1, will be bigger than equal to m minus epsilon for any epsilon. So that means this is just greater than equal to m. Okay, and you can use this or you can use the uh, f g1 norm, either way, you can replace that by, by the 1 norm of f times g, it will be the same. Okay, and then what we show so far is that on the one hand, we know that this is less than or equal to this, which is equal to OM, as we defined here. On the other hand, we show that this is also bigger than that. So this concludes the, uh, makes the, it verifies the claim, which says that the uh, the f infinity norm is just a supremum of you can either again you can either just use this you can either use this or use that one norm of five times g okay so this this actually holds okay now we are going to uh, Give an example why that, uh, in general, that we only have the supremum but not the maximum. Um, for example, uh, we consider the set E to be the interval 0, 1, and then we set f of x to be x. So in this case, the infinity norm of f should be equal to. 1. Okay. And the question is if we can find a uh, function g, uh, r1 function g, whose r1 norm is equal to 1, but uh, uh, the we can never find, uh, but this one is less than this, which is equal to 1. So uh, suppose this is not true. Okay. If we have this equal to the maximum, that means we can really reach the maximum value. It 
That means we can find some g in R1 of this interval such that the g norm, which is this, is equal to 1, and the integral of f and g is equal to um, this, which is which is equal to 1. Okay, um, now we know the x is, f is just x, so f of x is just a x and the g uh, let's say that we assume the g is you no know, we can always assume g is uh, on the negative value or we just take that okay because this is never it's going to be you no know, if we have some g negative value we just uh, take its absolute value okay and then uh, we'll have this equal to one but if this is really true then what happens is uh, this is the one, so this is also the the uh, one norm of G, according to the property of G, right? So this would be that. So this means that the two sides are equal. This is equal to that. Well, if these two are equal, then I use I move the left to the right, then we have zero equals to the integral of one minus x times g g x. Let me write everything out. So we'll have, we would have this. But, but when we have this, and we see that when x is between 0 and 1, this is a greater than or equal to 0. This is a greater than or equal to 0. So I have a non-negative even the integrand, and the integral is equal to 0, means that the integrand is 0 almost everywhere. So that means 1 minus x, gx, is equal to 0 almost everywhere in this interval. Well, at least we know that the uh, 1 minus x is only 0 when x is equal to 1. And it will be non-zero for any other x. And it's still 0 almost everywhere. just means that this needs to be 0 almost everywhere on this. Okay? And if it's 0 almost everywhere on this, it's also 0 almost everywhere on this because you just add one single point okay so the g will be zero almost everywhere but this is a contradiction to that okay? so this implies that the g is zero almost everywhere but it's a contradiction to the fact here okay and this is why we cannot really get this maximum so we do have the supremum that's okay but we never reach the maximum when the p is equal to infinity. Okay, so that's a remark I want to uh, make. So, um, what well, in summary, what we have is uh, if L q, so if p is bigger than one or bigger than or equal to one, or I should say, then the f p norm is equal to the maximum of uh, well the integral of f g if you like to use this way or you can write this as the maximum of g in l q q is superscript divided by the g norm the, the q norm of g that's for this p uh, equal to 1 to infinity, from 1 to infinity. But if p is equal to infinity, then the f infinity norm will be equal to the supremum of this fg, where g1 norm is equal to 1. Or in other word, you have the g in R1 and the integral of fg over the g norm. One norm of g, okay. So just uh, being careful with the, the maximum supremum here for these two cases. Okay. Um,
So in, as we mentioned before, uh, in this case we call our Q space the due space. The due space of our, our P space. Okay, if the P if P is a Q is a conjugate of P. Alright, now uh, let's see uh, uh, example or uh, theorem or lemma that would be going to show our last uh, th theorem in subsection. So the theorem here uh, is to say that suppose we have g that is a measurable function we always assume a function to be measurable okay then let p be between 0 and the infinity so it can take a value infinity and the q is, is conjugate Uh, if there exists some m such that uh, for any simple function There is then uh, the G C L Q. And uh, the Q norm of G is less than equal to M. Okay, let me repeat what the, the theorem says. Uh, it says that if we have a measurable function G and uh, the P is any number between 1 and plus infinity, could be infinity, Q is the conjugate of P. Okay, now it says that if there exists some M such that for any simple function phi in RP, uh, there is this there is this then the g must be in our q and the q norm of g must be less than equal to m so this is actually pretty close to what we uh, have previously because you can basically imagine that from here you can say if this divided by the p norm is always less than equal to m remember that uh, the if phi is in our p, if phi is not a simple function but a general uh, function in our p, and uh, this is less than equal to m means that the supremum is less than equal to m for phi in our p. Okay, and this left hand side will be just equal to the g q norm of g. And actually, this uh, yeah, it should be supremum. Um, well, this seems that the natural we will naturally get this. But the point right now is that they only guarantee this for simple functions. So those five are simple functions. And then in this case, um, this is potentially bigger than bigger than that. This is potentially bigger than that if you only you are only allowed to take simple function here. So that's why there's still a little bit difference, but we will be able to show that we can still get that. Okay, we can still get that. And uh, let me show you how. This is achieved. Uh, we consider the p for three different cases. So let's say first, p is finite and uh, bigger than one, so it's, uh, it's greater than one but not infinite. Then we let the psi k to be a sequence of simple functions. Simple functions, such that the psi k will goes up to this. Okay, so this is the measurable function. So we can always 
you know, a non-negative measurable function, we can always use a sequence of simple functions to approach that. And then we let the phi k to be the sine of g times the psi k. So the psi k is non-negative, but we need the sine of g. So the multiply these two together, we'll get a, a simple measurable function, a simple function as well, but you could take a negative value. Now, well, let's say we check these two things. One thing is that we check the, the uh, g times phi k. So they will be equal to the g times the sine of g and then the uh, phi k. And this is equal to the absolute value of g times the phi k. But remember that the phi k goes up to that. So this means this goes up to this, and by Monpon convergence theorem, this will converge to the g times the 1 plus 1 over p minus 1. Okay, And the, this quantity here is just a p over p minus 1, so which is equal to q. So this is just equal to the uh, integral of the q, uh, q's power of of g. Okay. On the other hand, we have the uh, uh, g phi k will be less than equal to m times the uh, the p norm of phi k, and uh, this is equal to m times the phi k will be. Uh, the k p norm will be just this. Okay, and we know that this absolute value of phi k is the same as the absolute value of it's just same as phi psi k because you take the absolute value here to be just this, but this is already a non-negative value, so it's just approaching that. So the absolute value of this will approach to this. Okay, and the p's power of that will approach the p's power of this. So that's why this becomes the uh, um, converge to the g p or p over 1 to the power 1 over p. But this is equal to q again. Okay, so we'll have this equal to m times this g, the q norm of g, and um, and the q p one. Okay. Oh, sorry. The q q over p. So there will be q over p. But the q over p is just a uh, one over p. Uh, yeah, it's good. Because let me just keep it to Q over P. Q over P. So what have we said so far is that on the one hand, this converts to this, or just convert to this. Let me summarize it. So the G phi K will convert is, itself will convert to the uh, integral of the Q to the power of G. On the other hand, the G phi K will be less than equal to uh, m times phi k p norm, but this will convert to that, q over p. So this implies that these two, two together, implies that uh, this is less than equal to m times this, q over p. Well, this is equal to just uh, the q q to the power of the q norm, and then you have that on the one side. So we just uh, divide both sides by this quantity, and then we will have the uh, g of q norm of g and the q minus q over p. But the q minus q over p is q times uh, one minus one over p. Right? But this is just a 
this is just a one over q. That's why it's just equal to one. So this thing is just equal to one. That's why this is just less than equal to m, and that's the q norm of g is less than equal to m. Okay, and that's how we show this. So it's in R q and the q norm of g is less than equal to m. So that's the case where p is uh, bigger than one but not infinity. Now the second case is that p is equal to infinity. And in this case, we want to show that the R1 norm of g is less than or equal to m. Okay, and to show this, just let phi to be the sine of g. Now apparently, if g is then zero, this then this phi is uh, the R infinity norm of phi will be just equal to one. Okay, and also. Uh, we can see that the integral of g phi, which is equal to the absolute value of g, and the apparently this is less than equal to m. Uh, sorry, it's less than equal to m times the infinity norm of phi, and this is just equal to m. Okay, and what this implies is that this as the one norm of g is less than or equal to m. So g is in R1, and the R1 norm of g is less than or equal to m. Okay, so the last case, p is equal to 1. So in this case, uh, the phi, the simple function phi, should be in R infinity. Uh, sorry, it should be in R1, and uh, we're looking for, we're trying to see if g is in R infinity, and if the R infinity norm of g is less than m. So this is what we're trying to show. Um, so we first show that proof by contradiction. If this g is not in our infinity, then that means uh, we let a k to be the set of points where g is bigger than or equal to k. And then we know that the measure of a k so first of all, the AK will be decreasing, right? It will be not increasing set. Uh, since the larger K, then the smaller the set is. And on, a, on the other hand, we know this, the measure of AK must be bigger than zero for any K. Because if it is equal to zero for some K, then that just means that K has, uh, the K is the essential upper bound of G, or is upper bound of G, and that means G is bounded by, is smaller than K almost everywhere. And that is a, that is that doesn't it's not this right it's not what we assumed so this has to be greater than zero for any k well uh, if this is the case then we can consider the phi k which is uh, which is set to to the characteristic function of a k then we can see that the l one uh, the l one norm. Sorry, we, check, we can check, check the, the g over a k, and this should be equal to the g times the phi k, because of the definition of the phi k. And we know that this is less than or equal to uh, m times the one norm of phi k. Right? And the, the one norm of phi k is just uh, the uh, integral of the characteristic function, and this is just uh, the mu of ak, or the measure of ak. This is m times the measure of ak. So we know that. But on the other hand, we know that over the set ak, the g has a uh, value greater than or equal to k. So, well, let's say that we assume the g is. Uh, Without loss of generality, we we'll assume that g is non-negative. So this is just uh, greater than or equal to k times the measure of ak. Okay, and since ak mu ak is uh, has a positive measure, then that means that we can cancel these two. And what it implies is that for any k, m k is less than or equal to m, and that is impossible because k is increasing. Uh, k is going to infinity as an integer. 
student to infinity. So that's a contradiction. So it's a contradiction. And then that means uh, the G cannot be in our infinity mode. Cannot have this. So the G must be in our infinity. Okay, and then it will be uh, easy to show that the uh, our infinity norm of G must be less than equal to M. Uh, to show that, uh, let's say, if the essential upper bound R is if the G infinity norm is bigger than M, uh, say is equal to M M tilde, uh, is equal to M tilde, which is bigger than M, then. Uh, so that means there exists a uh, uh, how should I say this? So let's then let this A to be the set of points where G is actually bigger than M half of this. Okay, and this must be uh, the mu of a must be positive because if it's zero, the measure is zero, then the essential upper bound is not uh, amplitude but is this or even smaller than this. Then uh, mu of a should be we let this, then the mu of a must be positive. Okay. Um, Let's even assume that if A is uh, infinity, then we just choose a finite subset of A, but with positive measure. So we we now lost generality, we just assume that the mu of A is also finite. So it's bigger than zero and finite. As I said, if it's not, we just uh, you know cut a, um, a finite part or, or a bounded part of that. Okay, and then what happens is we can choose my uh, phi to be the characteristic function of a, and then the one norm of phi will be just the integral of say a, and that will be just the measure of a, which is, you know, it's a positive finite number. But on the other hand, we will have the g phi. Uh, then this should be equal to the g times the characteristic function of a. And over this a, we know that it's bigger than or equal to um, m tilde plus m over 2. Okay, and on the other hand, uh, this is bigger than that, and also uh, times, so I should write it this way. So I know that the integral of uh, g and phi is equal to the integral of g and the a, but over the a, as we said, this is the bigger than equal to this m plus m tilde over 2, this is equal to the half m plus m tilde times mu of a. Okay, that's one, that's one thing we know. On the other hand, we know this must be less than equal to m times the one norm of uh, phi. The one norm of phi we said is just m times the mu of a. But mu of a, again, this is a positive number, so we can cancel it. So we will have m tilde plus m divided by 2 is less than m. But that's impossible because, well, this is m. We said m tilde is some number bigger, and uh, this is the midpoint. Okay, so that's not possible. So again, it's a contradiction. So the the uh, our infinity norm must be less than that, and that completes the last case. All right. Uh, now is uh, the goal of doing that is to, to show the following interesting result. It's called the generalized Minkowski, uh, Minkowski's uh, inequality. Okay, we learned the Minkowski's inequality uh, in the last uh, uh, or two lectures earlier. But uh, the generalized one actually will imply the one we learned before.
Okay, so what this uh, what this theorem is? Suppose P is in here, and F is mapping from R cross product of R and R in to R. Uh, if for almost every y, the f of x y as a function of x, y is fixed, as a function of x, x is in Lp, and m. We denote the m to be the number, the integral here, which is, uh, is this. For every fixed y is a function of x, so I can consider the this function as a function of x. We can consider it as uh, our p norm. So this is essentially for every fixed p. Um, this part is uh, the um, you will write it this way the p norm of this f uh, dot, which means that for fixed y is a function of x, then the p norm of this function of f x is the integral, and then we take the integral of y. If this is negative, if it is finite, if this is finite, then so that means. Uh, so let me expand that uh, afterwards. Then we will have the following inequality. Uh, this is called generalizing, generalized Minkowski inequality. So what it says is the integral, if we switch the order of the integration, we do the y first. But the, there's also a, another difference is that you're not taking the absolute value or p to the power of the, the inside function f, but you take the integral first. And then take the p to the power. And then this one, the one over p to the root, will be less than equal to m, which is this quantity right here. Which is this quantity here. Okay, I will do not copy anymore. So, what this generalized mean inequality says is if p is greater than or equal to 1, but not infinite, uh, and f is a uh, function, if for, a, if for almost every y, this f of x, y as a function of x, is in our p, and also this quantity here, this double integral, where you treat this f as, for fixed y, you treat this f as a function of x, then the p norm of that inside will give you a value, but it depends on y. So now it's a function of y, uh, and it's defined as that, and then you take the integral with the respect to y. If this number is finite, then you're going to show, we, we can show that uh, you take the integral of y first and then treat this as some function of x so you can call this uh, gx and then the lp norm of this gx is going to be less than equal to this which is basically so we said it's just this where you treat this f as a function of x for any fixed y So this is the like you take the integral of this, then we become function of gx, and this right hand side will be just like the, or I should say, uh, um, um, should I call it? Well, let's just say this, just uh, leave it like this. Okay, just remember that inside it will be a function of x. Okay, so to see how to prove this. Uh, so if p is equal to 1, then actually the two sides are equal, right? Because if p equals to 1, um, apparently, uh, you know, you can get the result immediately because you're taking the absolute value. On the left-hand side, you're taking the absolute value after, you, after the integral. And uh, on the other hand, on the right-hand side, you have the absolute value directly inside the integral, so it must be less than equal to the right-hand side. 
uh, the interesting case is what p is bigger than 1. So if that's the case, then we define uh, this to be the integral of f x y for fixed uh, for fixed x I'm going to take the integral of this with respect to y then I'm going to show that for any simple function phi we have we have the following we take the integral of this and apparently this uh, is integral uh, of with respect to x so the absolute value of this will be less than or equal to the absolute value of that right and this is equal to as we said I can put the, the integral or not it doesn't matter because always just are yeah. and then we have this by definition of the capital F is just uh, this And then the phi x dx. Well, uh, everything we're taking, all the integrands we're taking are positive, so we can use the tonality theorem. We can exchange the order of the integration. We can do the integration of x first. So that would be the phi x, sorry, f x y. Then phi x dx. So now, inside the parenthesis, it's a function of it's going to be a function of y. So it's a for a fixed y. We'll compute the value here uh, by using the holders inequality. This is less than or equal to the p norm, and then one over p, and then so this is for x, and then this is f x q dx. And then the one over q. And everything outside it will be the y. Okay. Uh, well, apparently, this this is uh, the q norm of phi, and it's independent of y, so it's just a constant to y. So we can move it out. So it will be just equal to the integral of this integral. For f x y p dx over p dy times the q norm of phi. Okay, so now what we have shown so far is um, um, this we said is equal to the m. As we define, now we show that for any simple function phi, for any simple function phi, we uh, we show this is less than or equal to m times this. Okay, and according to our ther theorem above, this implies that the uh, f is in L q and the q norm, sorry, r is l p, and the p norm of f is less than or equal to m. Okay, according to the theorem above. So let's expand what expand this uh, last one and see if that in, that actually implies our uh, result. So the p norm of f is just the uh, that's just the integral of f of x p 1 over p but this we can expand what uh, the f is the f is just the integral of f x y d y and then p dx then together 1 over p Okay, so apparently this is the bigger than equal to the left hand side. Bigger than equal to this left hand side, right here, because we're actually taking up this value uh, as we show here. 
Okay, and this is last time you go to the app, which is the value we have here. Okay, that's the last time you go to app. So this is actually the bigger than equal to the left hand side, but on the other hand, it's less than equal to m. So that's how we showed this is less than equal to m. Okay, so let's take a, another look what this actually tells us. Uh, it says that if uh, this inequality, if this is a finite number, which means that we, uh, for fixed y, we're going to take the take the p norm of this function uh, of x and then this number is going to be bigger than or equal to and uh, we take the integral first then take the p norm okay so that's what the generalized uh, Minkowski theorem uh, inequality says well it doesn't imply, imply something that we are familiar with uh, just by looking at the integral, uh, the inequality, but actually we can see that it reduces to the Minkowski inequality we, we mentioned before. And uh, the reason is, the key is that you need to choose the um, the function properly. You need to choose this function properly, and then it will indicate uh, many interesting results, including the Minkowski, the Minkowski inequality. So for example, Let's say that we have f and g in our p. The Minkowski inequality says that says this. Before, right? And then we can actually use the generalized Minkowski inequality to imply this. And the key is that we can define h x y to be uh, it's a mapping from r n by this so y is only between zero to two. X can be any uh, vector in R n. Let's define this. It's defined to be for any x and a y. Show x and a y. It's equal to f of x if y is between zero and one. And if y is between one and two, then we set to the g x. So let's set our h x to be this. And then we can check the capital M above is to check uh, the integral of this for x and then dy. This is 0 to 2. This is Rn. Okay, so let's see. This is our M in the previous theorem. Let's see what that is. Well, when uh, so it depends on what the y is. We separate it to two parts, zero to one of this dy plus the one to two of the same thing dy. But for y equals to between zero and one, we know that this quantity is just f of x. So what inside here is just f of x, and uh, then inside will be just uh, the two norm or the p norm of f of x. So this is just a uh, p normal of f, and that is a constant with respect to y. And similarly, this is just a constant, which is the p norm of g. So we just say that this is just a, that plus this. So that's the right-hand side, and it's a finite because f and g are in Lp. And now let's check the left-hand side. Left-hand side is this, and then uh, we take the integral with respect to y first, and then take the p norm, dx, then the over p. We know this will be less than or equal to m above. But let's see what this actually is. Well, here, this is again equal to um, 0 to 1 for hx, y, dy, plus the 1 to 2, hx, y, dy. And this is equal to we know that when y is between 0 and 1, it's just f of x, and that is just g of x. Okay, so whatever is inside is just the uh, integral of Rn, and uh, it's actually f of x plus gx inside to the power p dx, and then over p's root. And this is just uh, the p normal of f 
plus g. So we know from the generalized Minkowski's inequality, this is less than this is less than that, and this is actually reduced to the uh, Minkowski's inequality we had before. Okay, so that's the one um, case that can be uh, reduced to that. And now let's look at another example. It's not just uh, used to, to, to derive the original Minkowski's inequality, but uh, it's even more powerful. So for example, let's say that we have a sequence, or I should say that um, in R infinity. So this is the, the set of vectors with the infinite many components, or countable many components. So let's say that I have A, which is written as A K, K is from zero to infinity, or one to infinity, doesn't matter. And B is equal to A B K. And again, K is from zero to infinity. So when we define the LP norm, sorry. So what is the LP space? LP space is all the such kind of A in this way. Such that the uh, sum of a k to the power p, k is one from one to infinity. Well, you can take the one p to the root or not; it doesn't matter. Uh, what well, if it's p is equal to infinity? Then what this means is uh, the supremum uh, of those components. But uh, let's say just consider that p is less than it's not infinity. Then this is just uh, if this is finite. Then this RP space is just a denotes all these kind of uh, uh, even dimensional vectors. Okay, now uh, we're going to show that uh, the P norm of such one is defined to be this, defined to be this thing. Let's say k p k from one to infinity or zero to infinity. Or p. So this is our p norm. So what we're going to show is that a plus b p is less than or equal to a p plus b p. So similar to the Minkowski zero, uh, Minkow Minkowski is inequality. But this is for infinite, infinite dimensional vectors, or the LP space, the little lowercase l, LP. All right. Uh, so let's see what that is. Uh, and how do we get this? Well, in this case, again, we need to be care carefully define the function uh, x and y, f of x and y. And again, it's going to be from r. It's just from r by 0 2, or just r plus, to uh, the number r. So what it actually does is the f of x, y is going to be equal to ak if this uh, y is between 0 and 1, and that the x is between k and uh, k plus 1. Okay, so you can see that from k is 0, 1, 2, 3. So on each of these intervals, I uh, was going to take the corresponding ak. And when y is uh, bigger than 1, so we would be taking the bk. k less than equal to x less than k plus 1. Okay, so I'm going to define our f to be this way. And then we're going to, again, apply the generalized hypothesis inequality and see what happens. So let's say the m should be equal to the integral. We should do the x first. So it says it's a 0 to plus infinity, f of x and y. Uh, p to the power dx, then the 1 over p, and dy. So let's look at the, the inside. Uh, oh, well, we first separate this into two. dx, this, or p, dy, dy plus the, the same thing, but the integral is from 1 to 2 for y. dy. Okay, so when x, y is between 0 and 1, we know that this is just a, uh, um, this we can, inside of this, we can just separate it to k from 0 to infinity, 0 k to k plus 1. 
So now the x is between k and uh, k plus 1, and y is uh, between 0 and 1, so we know this value is nothing but just uh, the a k, absolute value to the power p, because this thing here is just a k. Okay, and then we have the dx, but you know this uh, parenthesis, inside the parenthesis it will be just this, and uh, this is just equal to the sum of a k piece power because uh, it's just a piecewise constant on each of these interval, intervals and those intervals all have a length 1 okay, that's what happens to this integrand it's just equal to this and that is equal to this okay, and so we can see that um, it's just uh, the sum of a k Power p k from one to uh, zero to infinity, then one over p, and then take the integral. But this one is independent of y, so you take the integral of y, it will be just multiply one. And similarly for the other one, the second term will be just a uh, um, b k p one over p. So that's what happens to this term. It will be just that. Okay, and this is happens to be the uh, p norm of a plus the p norm of b. We want it on the right-hand side. And now look at the left-hand side. Left-hand side should be the integral for uh, 0 to infinity, then the, the 0 to 2 f of x y dy, then uh, p's power dx, then 1 over p. Okay, so now I'm going to do the inside first. This is going to be equal to the 0, 1, f of x, y, dy. Um, let, me, let me do this in this way. So inside the big parenthesis, that would be just equal to 0 from k from 1 to infinity, and then k, k to 1. Okay, and the, the integral is going to be, sorry, 0, 1, f of x, y, dy, plus 1, 2, f of x, y, dy, and then the p to the power and d, dx. So that's what I have. And now x is between here. y is either here or here. But if it's in here, I know that this one is just a k. And if it's a y is in here, then I know this is just a b k. So what we have inside is just a, this thing is just a k, this thing is just a b k. So what I have is this whole thing will be just a, the sum of a k plus b k to the power p for k from zero to infinity. Okay. Or mm, yeah, I should uh, I should extend this to that. Or maybe just this. So I know that this part is just uh, that. So this is essentially just the sum of k okay, from 0 to infinity, a k plus b k to the power p, and then 1 over p outside. And that is essentially just a plus b p storm. Okay, because a plus b just denotes this k from 0 to infinity, so it's this infinite dimensional vector. Okay, and you can see that it reduces to this result, and that's for the, the infinite dimensional vector space. Um, and that's also a special case of the generalized Minkowski's theorem, uh, Minkowski's inequality.